Welcome to Springboard Your Virtual University. My name is Albert Okran. Welcoming you to the Easter edition of your favorite broadcast, Ghana's foremost developmental program running since 2008. Springboard is brought to you by the Springboard Roche Foundation and proudly sponsored by the Enterprise Group, UMB Bank, MTN Pulse, with media support from the Multimedia Group and the Graphic Business. So today we bring you the second in our already trending series of conversations with heads of Ghana's leading universities or tertiary institutions. It's the Don's Conclave right here on Springboard, your virtual university. And guess what? It's educative, innovative, and in a sense, keenly competitive because you want to back your institution. So if you missed last week, where were you? This is a series this month bringing together five of the heads of Ghana's leading universities, sharing their five life lessons garnered on their journey and five prescriptions for world-class education in Ghana. Our guest for last week was Professor Nana Baapianfo from the University of Ghana, shared some very interesting lessons. If you missed it, find it on Facebook, YouTube, and share your thoughts and your comments and by the way if you are backing your institution here is how you can do it if you are a student alumnus faculty staff friend even if you are planning to attend this institution or your ward is planning stay tuned pull out your phone dust it and get ready to listen to the thoughts of your vc and back it with your vote on social media. I'll tell you how you can do it very shortly, but this is very, very exciting. My guest for today is, was adjudged the CIMG Marketing Man of the Year for 2019, followed closely after by um, a vote as the Educational CEO of the Year last year. And he's someone I have known since 1989. <laughs> Professor Abednego Fenhi Okoamati is Vice Chancellor of the University of Professional Studies in Accra, UPSA. <laughs> Prof, finally, 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 I get you on Springboard of Virtual University. Good to see you. Good to see you. Remember the crowd. Amazing please, job you are doing here. Please call me Albert, <laughs> as we used to do when we were in school. <laughs> How are you, sir? I'm fine, sir. Good to see you. Uh, good to see you, too. Wonderful. Uh, great job you are doing here. Thank you very much. With the registrar. Yeah, yeah my boss. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Good, so, good job. <laughs> so, anytime you talk about UPSA, from the corridors of power to the ordinary man, to anyone who drives past the university, the, the first thing that people think about is that university that has marshaled internal resources to build facility after facility and for a country like ghana it's probably one of the areas mm. of greatest interest mm. so before we get down to your story <laughs> tell me what is happening at upsa <laughs> well god is good i mean <laughs> we do a bit for modern ghana i mean it's um, we do what we have to do i call it responsible leadership and over the years i think upsa has experienced that so it has helped as it has as well, but it's all for Ghana. I'll tell you what, I, I, and I, I, I salute my, my friend, uh, Pastor Mac McDonald, as many you, you all call him as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I remember he, he was the one who made me m take note of UPSC because mm -hmm. he went to IPS in those days. Mm -hmm. And because he was very close to me, I took a yeah. particular interest in IPS in those days, yeah. juxtaposing the IPS of ASO's time mm -hmm. to the UPSC of today. I must say it's been a, a remarkable transformation. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I spot, I spot <laughs> if I may, from the outsider's perspective, mm -hmm. note three key leaders who have driven this. Just give us a sense of, of the journey and a bit of how we got here. Um, well, of course, it's always good to pay tribute to the founder. Um, incidentally, still alive. Oh, um, wonderful. Opokwampuma. I think he should be 94 years now. And successive directors and rectors, um, especially for uh, Reverend J.J. Mati, now Canon J.J. Mati, and the Professor Joshua Labi. Um, and uh, Reverend J.J. Mati, he started a degree program. That was a game changer. The Professor Labi took it from there, um, saw a lot of expansion, infrastructure, programs, 
And by God's grace, we also took the baton and we are where we are. I want us to first get your, your key life lessons, the, the five things that when you sleep and they wake you up and they ask you, mm. tell me what, what must I do to, to, to progress in life? Mm. What, what, what will be the five things? Mm. Okay, so first, in, first list them and then we'll get mm. on to why. All right, so um, if I wake up 2 a.m. and you ask me what will be the first one, I would say it's old fashioned, but it still works hard work. Okay, so hard, hard work, work is number one. one. Hard work. Okay. Then number two, attitude. Okay. They say attitude is everything. Yeah. Okay. Number three, preparation. Mm. You are what people call luck because those people are prepared. So preparation. Of course, number four, gratitude. Okay. <laughs> gratitude to God, to those who have helped you, your parents, your guardians, your spouse, uh, friends colleagues, um, the family. Um, and then, of course, number five, I call it the kiss principle. I keep it simple and short. A friend of mine says, um, I keep it simple and stupid. That's not what I mean. <laughs> we keep it simple and short. So uh, those are my five main lessons in life that I've learned. Wow. Mm. I'm going to come to those lessons as we go along. Mm. But I've, anytime I meet someone who occupies a position that that is a leadership one. Mm -hmm. I'm much more interested not in where they are now and what they seem to be enjoying in quotes, the, the, the attention of the public to the great work they are doing. Mm -hmm. I want to track back to the time when nobody knew them, mm -hmm. the beginnings, and find out what choices did they make so that anyone listening who mm -hmm. wants to get mm -hmm. to the talk can say, okay, yeah. I can identify with this and I think I'm on the right track. Mm -hmm. So let me backtrack to... to the beginnings of your career journey mm. was academia ever in your mind <laughs> um so of course just to go back a bit i'm um, the fifth of six children and i'm the fifth boy so that's why they call me fame because okay. fame is all is well yeah because obviously those days you expect to have first born boy second boy third boy, fourth boy, fifth boy. Then they say, okay, fame, all is well. Um, <laughs> more or less, like, well, we appreciate all that God has done. And so growing up at La, um, of course, my, my grandfather, my grandmother, they had 10 children. My mother was a, the, the fifth one. Those days, the ladies would not go to school. It's the men who would go to school. And so the, the women would um, help selfish to take care of the the gentleman, only the last girl, there was now some enlightenment, so she had to go to school, she became a medical doctor. But then um, we all grew up in the same house. Um, I'm sure we were more than 50, 60 in the house, but it was a lovely place. Um, until I lost my mother um, and often then, my my uncle who became my adopted father, back with uncle Zoe calling, they took us in, and he's a lawyer, so we saw we saw the way um, if you work hard, you can actually achieve success. And so I went to University of Ghana. But before I go to University of Ghana, I went to Aquinas. They went to prepare calisis form. And like everybody else at the time, we wanted to go to University of Ghana. So uh, I chose University of Ghana. Then when the results came, my, <laughs> my father, my uncle said, oh, these days, if you do professional programs, you, you do well in life. So, I should go do marketing at IPS. We had heard about IPS then, um, the great IPS. So I didn't know the place. I took um, a car from um, La all the way to Medina, asked for the direction, and I got to the place. So I asked, where is IPS? He said, this is it. I said, this is IPS. <laughs> they showed me something else. <laughs> and so I resolved that. I was never going to go to IPS, but of course I couldn't tell my uncle. So at the time, Dr. Soa, um, also an uncle and a family friend, who was then the head of the department at the University of Ghana, a course department, uh, went to me and said, please, can you please speak to my uncle on my behalf? Because I really don't want to go what to is, IPS. What is, what didn't what want to go there. I mean, just across the road, you see University of Ghana, massive University of Ghana, the infrastructure, the beauty. And now this is IPS. So 
Um, now, thankfully, my uncle allowed me to go to the um, University of Ghana to do economics. And so when I finished economics, it, uh, I went to do my, my national service in the central region, Praso, and came back um, just like everybody else. He wanted to get a good job, Unilever, uh, Merchant Bank, Stand Chart, Barclays. So you put in the application uh, full of faith, full of hope that you will get a job. Uh, six months, one year, two years, no job. <laughs> now when you wake up in the morning, you, you are wondering, what next for you? I got so tired that finally I decided to lower my expectations. So uh, I saw an advert to teach at a primary school, Star of the East, uh, with my economics degree I applied. I went for the interview, saw a lot of people. At the end of the day, they said I was, I was overqualified. <laughs> <laughs> a degree in economics we are coming to teach in a primary school. Fortunately, one person did not accept the offer, so I was called to replace the person. Uh, I guess my joy uh, to be a people teacher, class six. Um, so I started teaching. I enjoyed <laughs> teaching those young kids. Then the dream that my uncle wanted me to achieve, that is to have a professional program, came back again. So. It's, Whilst you are doing this, um, you are teaching in the primary school, why don't you go um, take classes in marketing? So we went to Vera Beach at the time, CIMG. They used to have those classes there. So after 2 p.m., then I will go for, I'll go for the classes. A few months into my teaching at Star of the East, then in um, they started the advert for uh, VAT. Uh, so I applied. And I was taken. I remember Honorable Setekbe then um, was a deputy head. And they posted me to Sunyani. I remember going to Setekbe then that I wanted to be posted to Accra because I'm doing this course. He looked at me and said, Young man, you guys walk around and say you don't have any job to do. They give you a job now, you are telling us where to post you. <laughs> He, he just didn't walk away. Imagine his face telling you that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, he just didn't walk that way. And my uncle sat me and said, "You have to go." So I registered to write the exams, advanced certificate, then now professional diploma. I registered to write those exams. I registered all four, and I came to write all four. Uh, what I didn't know was that uh, the convention was that you write one or two so that you could pass. But because I didn't know, I, I registered all four and wrote all four. And when the results came, I passed three out of the four. Apparently, my colleagues, because they were attending classes after work, they didn't have, even have the chance to write the exams. And so they had deferred. Me, that I left for Sunyani, I was not attending classes because I felt I was disadvantaged. I was rather learning and I came to write and I passed three out of four. So I was ahead of them. Then I learned the lesson that um, sometimes what you don't know is good for you. Um, so um, I then started that, okay, so this is the, the, the path to go. Within three years, I've been promoted um, at VAT service. If VAT was abolished, came back, we joined IRS then, came back. So three years, I was promoted. Six, six years, I was promoted again. And the sixth year, the entire region, I was the only person promoted among my colleagues. Interestingly, that was the same week I, I left that service. Um, and I think I see Joy FM here. I was listening to Joy those days. It was on Sky in Sunyani. They were interviewing, I think, Dr. Kwesi Jonah. And I felt that I wanted to be like this man, an academic. There various issues and all of that. Uh, it's like a light just came on that this is what I wanted to do. So I applied to come and do the MBA then. I had the admission. So the week I was promoted, I put in the request that I should be granted steady leave. So I left for Accra. One year into the journey, then I got the letter that sorry, they couldn't grant the steady leave. I had a choice to make. The choice was to stop school and go back to VAT. And VAT at the time, they pay well. I mean, you're a tax man, put your white shirt, your tie, Especially when I spent two years without a job. And now you have a good paying job. People respect you. And now you have to stop. The choice to stop or to say, I've stopped school and go back to work. 
That's a tough one. It was a very, very tough one. I prayed, I fasted. It was still very difficult. Finally, I just woke up one day and decided that I've stopped school. Um, no, I've stopped work. I'll continue with my, my education. What that meant was that there was no um, income for me. And I was, I was newly married with a daughter. Um, you have to rely on your wife's <laughs> income. So you, you should add my, my, the right person, my the right person to this question. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's why I said gratitude. Because it's right. important to appreciate those who have helped you and on, on your journey. Um, um, my uncle who took care of me and all of that. So um, now you, you get up, you go to school, your colleagues will go to work, they will come for, for lectures. So another challenge that I face, I then decided that what I would do is to spend all my time in the library because you cannot go home and come back. You didn't have enough money for transportation. So after lectures, I'll stay and then um, I'll read, I'll study. And then the, the, we have the evening lectures as well. Because I was spending a lot of time in the library, more or less, I, was, I could prepare so well. So my other colleagues who were working, who were my discussion mates, when they come, then I would explain to them and say, okay, um, this is what uh, we learned. Uh, this is the explanation, all of that. So they then would buy food for me because I was, uh, I was more or less le like their second lecturer. Um, they, are, they are teaching assistant. So they would buy food for me. If they start to do photocopy, they will pay for it because I would do the explanation. And because of that, my grades were very good. Um, I, was, I was doing so well, and not because I was a student, but because I was spending a lot of time in the library and learning preparation and hard work. So that came in. So um, one day, after a year, there was one lecture I study. I think he saw my grades and was like, ah, who is this guy? So he asked of, of who is this guy? And then mm, I said, oh, I was the one. They said, oh, you are so good. Um, can you please help me um, in lecturing? So I'll go to his office. I volunteered. I would help. By the time I was completed, so when I finished, he said, come and help me. I spent an entire year helping me study in his, in his office. Um, so I will go. He will teach two hours tutorials. I will help the students. And because that's what I wanted to do, I wasn't paid for it, but I was excited. The fact that I could also impart knowledge. And finally, I could just stand before people and be explaining things to them. So I would dress well, get my nice tie, the tie is for my wedding, that same tie, I would put it on. And then I would dress well, go to class, and go and teach these young ones. But apparently, there were also some mature students in who, of course, needed some further explanation. This is what I used to do with my colleagues, um, those who my discussion made. So they invite me to come over to their hostels to, to teach them. In turn, they would pay me for the explanation I was giving to them. And they felt that they were passing. So I mean, third party referrals, they would tell others that, oh, this young man is so good. Um, he's done his master's, he'll come and help you teach. So now I was enjoying helping me study them more because even though they wasn't paying me, I was getting being paid by, <laughs> by some of the students to help them. So the project was going to become a consultant. Oh, you could do this, you could do that. You get the information here. And so suddenly, I was all over the place, uh, from Barclays Bank to Giyop to do all those big guys doing their executive MBA. Just pause at the point. You see, I've just seen how the education and entrepreneurship all began. So it was not really like a formal thing. It no. was a, almost like a hobby that you began to yes. commercialize. Yes, I just or, enjoyed or that it. attracted financial yeah. returns. Yes. Let's, let's, let's go with this. Yeah. I'm liking it. So, so I enjoyed it. So I was all over the place and all of that. So then the, so it, I started having the confidence to teach because then big men and women are calling you to help and that kind of thing. So I was enjoying it. Uh, but of course, I still needed to have a formal job because you have a family to take care of. So I saw this advert by, um, from IMS, um, now it's Yukons. Um, it's on the, um, the Kasua Road. It used Weja. to be on Weja. Yes, Weja. Yeah. Still, yes, University College of Studies. It used to be IMS. So I saw the advert, I mean, Dr. Opata of blessed memory. Um, so I applied. Good man, I met him a few times. <laughs> yes, a very, very interesting man, good man. Um, God bless you so. So I started teaching there. People told me that, no, um, it's not a place for you. Dr. Pata can be very difficult, so don't go there. But I wanted to teach, so I didn't listen to anybody. I just 
I just decided to join. I didn't tell me study that from from Legon. Then when Galamsi, then I go there to teach. I never told him. So <laughs> like I, was, I like that speech. Educational Galamsi. <laughs> <laughs> I just go there, go and do my, my my stuff. At the end of the month, I was expected to. I was expecting that I'll be paid. And then they invited me to the office. When I got in there, yeah, Dr. Potter was there with some staff members. Apparently, a staff meeting. He had a phone, um, those days, that old phone. And then he asked me a question. He said, when you applied, you said you teach at the University of Ghana. I said, yes. He said, you mentioned Mr. Adi. He said, yes. Then he told me, he said, it's not true. I was taken aback. And all the staff members were there. Without saying another word, he just called and placed on speaker. Um, he said, oh, Dr. Adi, how are you? The, the essay pleasantries. And he said, do you know um, a young man called Oko Abednego? Mind you, I had not told Mr. Adi that he, I go here to teach. So he wasn't even aware I was there. And they never mentioned that I was there. So they just said, do you know a young man called Oko Abednego? Then Mr. Adi, because it was a speaker, he exclaimed, he said, oh, do you want to employ him? He's a good man. He's very good. Employ him. You could just and you try to feel the, the way tension the, the tension in the room and the way I felt. I mean, it was something else. I learned a lesson. I had volunteered for Mr. Adi for one year without taking the personal. Mm. When it was necessary for him to, uh, to speak for me, he came through for me. Then uh, those who used to tell me that, why are you going to Legon to help Mr. Adi? He's not paying you, that kind of thing. What he did for me on that day was worth more than a million dollars. It's about reputation and integrity. Mm. And that is what he did for me. From that day, what? The relationship with Dr. Pata changed. In fact, until he died, he used to come to my office and he used to say, you need to come and head my university. And if you don't come, get somebody to come and head my university. Wow. That was what Mr. Adi did for me. That's how far he could take me. Um, if he, if he was paying me, he would not be under any obligation to do that for me and all of that. Interestingly, that day when I left, I came straight to the University of Ghana, Mr. Adi's office. He never mentioned that somebody made that call to him. And after, big, today, uh, after today, he never mentioned. He's never mentioned to me that, oh, one day somebody called to ask about you. So he's hearing about the first time on this show. So I'm sure okay. once he listens to it, this is the very first time <laughs> that he will hear that. I knew this is what happened and I was there. And I also never mentioned to him. And that is somewhere 2004 so almost almost 20 years now wow uh, that etc etc and so um i mean people talk about uh, these days young people they want to be paid for the job they do immediately and um, somebody asks you to help the person you want to get the the benefits here and now there are things that you have to do that um you get the benefits uh, years later sometimes i'm sure it will be eternity that god himself will pay you for uh, the good work that we do so I learned that, um, and so now I will leave um, Mr. Adi's office, I'll go and teach, at least it will come with a salary. But of course, it was a small university then, so the money wasn't enough, but I, I, it was fine. I mean, I could make some money from my Galamse and then also go to Mr. Adi's place, and then also, of course go to Weja. But I still needed to uh, up my game and get... Um, um, more resources to help the family. So one day I saw an advert. I think my wife even saw it uh, to all nations investing in Kofuridia. I think the day she saw it was the last day on a Friday and I applied. And she had a friend who was going to Esther, who was going to, to Kofuridia that day. So she took the letter. So she got there. When she got there, she sent it on a Saturday. They had closed the office. So she gave it to a security man. Got, gave it to a security man who then dropped it on a Monday morning. I forgot about it then. Somewhere January 2004. Um, I remember that because it was, um, I had attended Jericho R and they were having a 40 day prayer and fasting. So I decided to be part of it. Then I got a call. He said, It's Dr. Donko um, from All Nations University. He asked where I was. He said, well, I was in Accra. He said he was coming to Accra the following day where he would see me. I said, oh, he will see me at Action Chapel around 3 p.m. Unfortunately, I had gone to help somebody at, um, at Barclays Bank, the usual thing to, you know, 
to help her do her work. So I, I was a bit late. When I got to Action Chapel after three, Dr. Donko had come. So I saw the All Nations vehicle parked there. I approached it. They said, oh, Dr. Donko had entered um, the auditorium. So I chased him up there. Um, I saw him. And then he asked, do you attend church? I said, oh, no. But I'm joining the prayer and fasting. They just nodded. He asked that I accompany him to, to Koforidia the following day, if I don't mind. I said, I don't mind. He went to the place, asked that, you said you don't attend Action Chapel, but you were fasting with them. You are a good Christian. We have employed you. So that was how come I got, I landed at All Nations. <laughs> my, my, my faith and being gratitude to God landed me at All Nations. So um, I started teaching. Again, they just started, so the salary was not that um, big enough to take our family. But again, um, we are making progress. And all nations, I virtually taught, in fact, I taught virtually every, every course, every course from strategic management to marketing management to marketing communications, consumer behavior, uh, to communication skills, communication state, whatever. The point is that people were always resigning. And once they resigned, I just volunteered to take the course because I just enjoyed it. So I would leave home at 6 a.m., get to Kufuridia, just in fact, I would leave home before 6, get there around 8, I would teach till 9 p.m., get back to Accra. At the time, they had blocked the, um, the blue road, so use, use the Dodua road. So sometimes, 11 p.m., we we'll still be on the mountains. I recall one day when the car broke down on the mountains, and 1 a.m., we we're still waiting for the mechanic. Only for us to see a madman coming. Then the people in the bus said, that is the, the god of the area. Wow. Uh, come and see speed. <laughs> Everybody was running all over the place. But <laughs> those were kind of experiences that you had on the road. And then the following morning, you have to go again. And not much me, but I enjoyed it. That's my passion. I wanted to do it. And I was teaching virtually every course. Before I could realize, I taught about 15 different courses. The typical thing of a university, hmm, that you don't teach more than two courses. But for private investing that was beginning and, and people resigning because of um, their salary levels being low and all kinds of reasons, I was willing to volunteer and to support. Then one day I saw this advert for IPS um, 2006 um, for employment marketing. So I applied. After some few weeks or so, they they called that I should come for an interview. When I got there, I saw a lot of people. I said, immediately, I was like, but what am I doing here? I mean, <laughs> all these people, and they're coming for an interview. Then they gave us a form to fill. And the form, and a part of the form, what you are supposed to do is to mention the course you could teach. Of course, from, um, from UCOMS to um, all nations, I thought, more than 15 courses. So for me, I wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. But at the corner of my eye, I could see people were writing one, two, three. I thought, hey, what am I doing wrong? They came for the forms. It was my intent to, to get in. I went for the interview. I saw nine people. But they asked questions. And then one of the questions that came was, can you teach all of this? How come? And I said, oh, all nations. So I explained the fact that all nations, I ended up teaching all of these courses. So they just nodded. Now, apparently, that was 2006. IPS had started a degree program the year before. So a lot of their faculty had gone to do their masters to upgrade. So they needed one person for the marketing department. And they wanted somebody who could teach several courses. It's so happy that my experience at All Nations is now coming to help me because I taught several courses. The natural choice was myself and i knew people were, were better qualified one out of 50 and you were the one and, and i was the one that i was taking this <laughs> is springboard your virtual <laughs> university and, and, and as you can tell this is a very compelling story and i'm just listening and enjoying this is a very unique approach to uh the don's conclave with the vice chancellor of the university of professional studies in accra professor abednego okufenhi amati telling us step by step the story of his life and he gave us the table of contents up front so you know that it's about hard work 
everything in his life is done with hard work, volunteering for one year to teach for free. And then when he mattered most, that person speaking for him. The second one is about attitude. He says, listen, you just resign. I'll take your course and teach it. And so he learned to teach 15 different courses. And then preparation, he says, at the time when it mattered most, with 50 different people competing for one role, once he wrote that he can teach 15 courses, he was the chosen one. The fourth is about gratitude. Looking at the story of his life, thankful to God, to his uncle who looked after him, to Mr. Adi who opened the educational door to him, to his wife, and to everyone who has held his hand on the journey. Before we break, yeah. what about keep it simple and sweet? Yeah. Which one does that one do? Um, so, um, it's interesting. So, as a lecturer at IPS, um, I, would, I would take Trotro. We used to call it Trotsky. I don't know what they call it now. And when you close and you are going home, you see a lot of students that you are teaching. And you are wondering whether you take trotro with all your students. Sometimes you just stand at the bus stop as if you are waiting for someone and then wait for the, the students to go so that you can sit in quietly. One day, I waited and then a car came. It was virtually empty. So I went straight to the back. When I went straight to the back, then somebody just said, Oh, sir, good afternoon. <laughs> it was one of my, my students. <laughs> that, I thought I was hiding. Then I told myself, but what's the problem? The big deal. <laughs> There's no big deal about this. I mean, this is what I can afford. I just realized that keep life simple and short. Don't overspend. Mm. Don't keep up the Joneses. Live within your means. Now, I drive my own car. At that time, I didn't have a car. And I was taking, uh, not even taxi, trotro with the very students I was teaching. And that was it. Again, um, when I started my teaching at IPS then, and I had done master's MBA in professional program, that was accepted then. But I realized that it was getting to a time when the, the qualification for teaching was going to change. The emphasis started, they started the emphasis on research, I mean, master's in research, um, research master's. So as the head of the department then in marketing, I still went back to the University of Ghana Business School again to do an MPhil um, in marketing. And I do remember Professor Hinson, who was then interviewing, he said, why do you want to do your master's again? All of that? And I said, because I'm into academia. I was lovely informed that he actually put in the word, Professor Hinson put in the word and said, I should be allowed to do the, the MPhil uh, in marketing because they felt, others felt I had the opportunity to do MBA. And so I had to go back to do another two years master's degree. And in class were students who People are, you are, taught. are taught at IPS first degree and they were in class with me. And they used to call me Mr. Oko. And they, I was their HOD. I mean, if you look at me at my age and with these young people, and I, but I realized that it is what it is. I mean, it's, it's part of life. So. These are principles you've lived ever since, ever since I got to know you. And, and the story you tell is a story of, of truth, of integrity, of transparency. And I'm sure somebody listening tonight or today will be extremely inspired to live out their dream. This is Springboard, your virtual university. And good uh, hello to you, Professor Robert Ibu Henson. Your, your name has come up, so I salute you. We'll go for this brief break. When we come back, let's give Prof a slate and ask him, what should we do to improve the quality of education in Ghana to hit world-class status? Please don't go away. <laughs> well, now that we're all here, um, I want to start by saying what a difficult year it has been for all of us. But then there's also a lot to be grateful for. You know, like when I bumped my car into a taxi right at our junction and the insurance company paid my claims the very same day. And remember the surprise cash bonus we received for our funeral finance plan? That is what sponsored our trip to the beach. <laughs> and the song we sang all the way to Pram Pram. It's okay to dream with us. You 
I'm also grateful that every passing year brings me closer to enjoying the retirement benefits I have contributed so much to. And how since I started working from home after the COVID pandemic, I've been taking better care of myself. Even my doctor can attest to that. Speaking of that, I'm very grateful to the team at Transitions for giving Grandpa a befitting send -off. Well, on a happier note, I am grateful to have found an affordable office space to rent at Advantage Place. Enterprise, your advantage. Welcome back to Springboard, your virtual university. My name is Albert Okran, spending quality time today with the Vice Chancellor of the University of Professional Studies in Accra, UPSA, Professor Abednego Fenhi Oko Amati, telling us a beautiful story about hard work, attitude, preparation, gratitude, and the KISS principle. Keep it simple and short or sweet but not stupid and, and, and that simply means that if you have to go to class with your own students for a season to rise up again do it with a smile on your face prop this this should be a book shouldn't it um yes it's it, okay so it's in the pipeline you're writing yes how many chapters <laughs> it's in fact it's virtually ready the first draft is ready Okay. Uh, what, so, what's um, the title? I, I never wanted to say it, but okay. So, oh, no, let's advertise it. Let's advertise it. Let's <laughs> advertise it. What, what title are you thinking? Um, um, well, I have about three, four different titles, uh, but something about God is good should be part of it. Uh, the goodness so the, of God. So the byline, the byline will be God is good, um, and, and, and the top. Um, <laughs> I may keep this space. Keep yeah. this space. Watch this space. Watch, watch this space. So I tell Watch you something. Yes. One of these days. <laughs> Knowing that he's, 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 a, he's a former marketing man of the year, I'm sure he will carefully, prayerfully select the title. <laughs> Prof is also a reverend minister. And, and so let me greet your congregants at the Revival Outreach Church, yeah. the La yeah. Assembly. He's a chairperson of the church as well. So he's a big plate full of hard work that he's doing with all his heart. Mm -hmm. Prof, education, education, education. In our running series on mm -hmm. the top 10, we brought different people from different fields of life to share pers perspectives on their ideal Ghana. And without fail, mm -hmm. every single one of them has had something to say about education. Mm -hmm. Education is huge. Yeah. Many people are listening today saying, so what's next? How mm -hmm. do we get this right? Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, how do we build world-class education mm -hmm. right here in Ghana? And give it, give it, give it to me one, two, three, four, mm -hmm. five. Oh, we are number one. Okay. Okay, so before we don't understand that education is not just schooling. Um, education will take you from poverty. Education is a family planning tool. The more you keep, especially girls in school, the less likely that they are going to have children um, before the age of 18. So we've got to take education very serious. My first thing about education is this. By the age of nine years, we must insist that every child can read and write. That's my first, um, my first principle of education. If a child can read and write by the age of nine, you can never take it from the child again. It means that even if he stops school at that age, he still can read and write. So everything we do, the quality of teachers, motivation and all of that, must ensure that children 
can read and write by the age of nine. And that means that by the time they are in class three, class four, every child should be able to read and write. They, they don't need to get to um, GHS before they could read and write. Write from the age nine, it should be possible. In fact, for some children, even by the age, at the age of six, they should be able to read and write. But worst case scenario, every child in Ghana should be able to read by the, by, by the time they are they're in class three, class four. And you're saying that if, if, if they did that, if they did that, their education can never be taken away can, from can, them. In fact, that child can come back and still learn to do mature education. What, what is the current situation from your own, where you sit in, in general terms? <laughs> Sad to say, it's, so you can even get people who have finished senior high school, they are, they are unable to read and write. And that's how bad it can, it can get. And that's why I insist that we must ensure that children, by the time they are nine years, should be able to read and write. So that's your first prescription? Yeah, first prescription. What will be the second one? The second one is that we should shift, radical shift from learning by root. Now, now teaching children to just, um, um, <laughs> um, like we say, chew and pour, to have critical thinking skills. Um, like what, one, I mean, somebody put it this way. We should not let our schooling be an hindrance to our education. It should not be a hindrance to our education. We must teach people to think. I find out that in this country, and maybe Africa, we think that the person who is able to, like we say, chew and pour, is the best student. And so we judge students on the basis of the fact that they have reproduced what they were taught in class. All they have to do is to give what we give to them back. So it is from the lecturer's notes or teacher's notes to the student's notes and then back to the answer booklet without going through their heads. No, say that again. Yeah. I, I like this one. So, so from the teacher's notes to the student's notes, then back to the answer booklet without going through their heads. But that's a very, very big indictment. You know what? For fairness, mm. what we have done with mm. this program, mm. as you all realize, mm. is to pre-record it so that no vice chancellor knows what the other said mm. before the broadcast. Mm. So if you hear somebody saying exactly what the other person said, mm. the good news is that they don't even know what the other person said. Mm. But what you're saying mm. in the exact same thought line mm. is what your other colleague said last wow. week. Wow, wow, wow. And you are saying that... Mm. The net effect mm. is that the knowledge leaves the, le the lectures notes mm. to the students' notes mm. and to yeah, the answer, answer sheet mm. without going through the yeah, students' yeah, head. Yeah, yeah. So what, what then happens to the students? And then so we consider, then we think that these are the best students. But where we are now, people should be taught to think, to be analytical, to probe, to ask questions, to challenge. That is how we can educate. We are making schooling to rather be a hindrance to education. We are producing yes men mm -hmm. where we don't question anything. And this is not the way to learn. So those we say are the grade A students, in actual fact, a lot of the times, it's simply that they have reproduced what we give um, to them. And that's all that they have done. You notice that if I even look at those I've taught, those who have succeeded are not necessarily those who got A in class. So it's not that because you made an A, therefore you do well in life. You must teach people to think, mm -hmm. critical thinking skills. And you're seeing that even for your own students, mm -hmm. you're seeing that those who may not necessarily have gotten the A's yeah. have done far have better. Done far done so well. You feel very strongly about it? Yes, very. So very. what are you doing in UPSA to change yeah. this approach? Yeah. In fact, that is why UPSA is unique, very, very unique. Um, so, of course, you know our background. Fortunately, our background is that we are professional institution. And so, for starters, everybody who gets to UPSA necessarily, you'd have to take some professional programs, whether ACC or CE or CIMG, or CIMA, and you don't pay for it. 
we give you free tuition so at your own time then you begin to write the exams in fact we are finding out that people who come to UPSA they've never even read accounting before within four years are becoming chartered accountants mm. it's competition among our students that at the barest minimum at least you should do the the first level but we are getting a lot of our students who are completing the final stages before they, graduate. Are, before they graduate. In fact, the recent Deloitte um, a graduate program for, uh, for, for young managers, out of the 12 they chose from across the country, four, four came from UPSA. The best ICA um, graduates from, from UPSA. Interesting, these are not students who are getting first class, and yet they are doing so well. They, they are happy. So that's the first thing. The second thing is what people say, they say, oh, UPSA, you are, you are doing a uniform. Not that we are doing a uniform. We have what they call the, the professional Monday. You dress like a professional. If your jacket and your tie. Um, that when you go for interview, um, it is God who looks at the heart and not necessarily the outward appearance. But men look at the outward appearance first. So your appearance matter. So UPSA, we insist that Mondays dress well. And then we have all the presentations we do that you have to dress officially. You must learn to do PowerPoint presentation. In fact, presentation is key. It's a big thing um, at UPSA. So those soft skills is what we seek to give to our students. Every student at UPSA, you got to go, to, you have to do internship during the long back. And when you get to the third year or second year diploma, you got to do internship. And will, and you, will, and will, this, will this soft skills be, be another point under your, under your five or is it, or it's, or it's In fact, it's, it's actually a different point. Okay. Um, All right. So let's go on to your number three. So number one is by nine years, mm. every child must be able to read and write. Right. Mm. Number two is a radical shift from learning by rote to critical mm. thinking. Oh, we're number three. And then number three is the entrepreneurship and innovation. Help me to appreciate that. So entrepreneurial skills and innovation, which was what I was trying to allude to. That, you see, um, uh, Albert, um, Averagely, we produce 100,000 students from the tertiary institutions in Ghana every year, averagely, from Tenka investors, um, uh, mainstream investors, and all of that, 100,000. Um, we don't employ 10,000 uh, students a year into the formal sector. The question then is that 90,000, and then the previous ones, what do they do? Okay. So. We, our educational system was built on the fact that we were training people for so-called white-collar jobs and to work for the civil service and the public service, to work for, for people. What we must change that thing, we must move from um, that idea that you are being trained to work for somebody else. We must totally move from that. that you don't need to go and look for a job. True, there are people who work for others. And working for others doesn't mean that you have to work for government per se, or, or Unilever or Stanchart. Even among your colleagues, two, three of you can come together and, and set up something. And I saw a young man, I was driving out of campus, he was standing there, and then he was dressed to us. So he stopped and I saw one day, and I said, oh, he finished um, investing and he's written some books for, for children and that he was selling. I was quite impressed. So I bought some, even though I didn't need it. Uh, I wanted to see what he had, he had written. But I felt it was a good start. So this thing about always going to look for, for people to employ us at so-called big companies, we can't continue like that. So entrepreneurship and innovation is, is so critical. Oh, we are number four. And of course, number four, um, the good old IT. It's, it, it must permit everything we do. Do we realize that even um, the headquarters now use phones to do business? That you call them and tell them the time you are coming to the market and then they will meet you there. Um, um, I mean, COVID taught us so well that we didn't need the brick and mortar every time. Incidentally, these are things that we said it over and over till we were compelled to because of COVID. In fact, the UPS story Part of the things that helped us was the fact that we were able to move everything online during the period of COVID, such that we offered teaching and learning during the COVID times. We never, we never lost any time. So whilst 
institutions had closed down, we were still having a semester. And the other advantage was the fact that what it meant was that costs went down drastically, yet to be the same revenue. Mm. Is that one of the secrets of your generating revenue to be able to... In fact, we shouldn't have said that because it's supposed to be industrial secret. <laughs> <laughs> but we were able to make the same revenue and yet costs went down by, by 80%. Wow. And all of that. So these are some of the things that have got to be, think outside the box, innovative, entrepreneurial spirit, and of course, having the, um, the IT skills. I think that those are my four major ones that comes to mind readily that every child must read and write. It must ensure that the critical thinking skills, it must ensure that the entrepreneurial skills, it must also ensure that we use the technology, the myth aspect. I mean, IT is neutral. It's what you do with it uh, that will help, uh, that will help all of us. And all right, of, um, right. You've given a fifth one that you did not highlight, but mm. I'll still give you a chance if you wanted to change that one. But I, I, I was fascinated by what you said about about the dress code, PowerPoint, the soft skills. Mm. I thought that was a big one, mm. but you subsumed that one under your innovation. So mm. will, will there be another fifth one, or I could adopt that one mm. as a fifth? But we could just, actually that's what I meant. The, right. Uh, yes, I think uh, I think I like that one. Mm. The the fact that you you do the Monday dress code, the PowerPoint presentation, the soft skills, the presentation skills, the inter internships, internship, uh, yes, presentation skills mm. and internships. Do a professional program. Don't just do your yes. your your BSc accounting and go away. I mean, what degree will do is make you think. What the professional program will do is to let you work. So UPS, we say, we train the head, we train the heart, and we train the hands. I'm going to give you a chance to look into this camera and tell everyone listening why UPSA, in your opinion, mm -hmm. is the place to go. But I'm just fascinated by the thoughts you've shared. So for the benefit of everyone um, listening to us and watching us um, all across the world, these are the 10 incredible lessons. First from the story of, you know what, I could have listened to that story the whole day. I tell you what, <laughs> I, from, I, I just loved it. So if you just joined us, our guest on the Don's Conclave today has been the Vice Chancellor of the University of Professional Studies in Accra, UPSA, Professor Abednego Fenhi Oku Amati, sharing with us his lessons, first about hard work, then about attitude, then preparation, then gratitude, and the KISS principle. Those are the five life lessons. On education, he's kept it very simple and sweet. He says, number one, by age nine, all children must read and write. And if they do, you can never steal the education from them. Number two is a radical shift from learning by rote to critical thinking. Number three is what I would call the value added education. He says, in addition to everything they do at UPSC, he insists that they must go through a professional course while they are on campus. And sometimes, they graduate, they, they chatter from the professional course before they even graduate from the university. And in addition to that, dress code, PowerPoint presentation, and other soft skills and internships are a critical part of UPSC's curriculum. Now, before it's about entrepreneurship and innovation, is saying that averagely we produce 100,000 tertiary students, out of which only 10% are, are co opted into the formal sector. For that 90,000 people a year, we must reorient them from looking for jobs to creating jobs and believing that it can be done. And it can be done in various ways, including writing books for children, which you will buy when it is targets to where you are. <laughs> and the last one is, is about information technology. And it tells a story about transitioning seamlessly from brick and mortar education to during the COVID to virtual rendition without any time wasted. And that meant cutting costs and therefore being able to generate revenue for the university and by extension for the nation and the cause that he represents, that is, that is the University of Professional Studies in Accra. Prof, beautiful story. Let's do this again, definitely on this show, but look into this camera with the whole world watching and tell us why it is UPSC and nobody else. Okay, so UPSC is unique. Um, it's the only university in Ghana, in Africa, where... Um, you can have both professional and degree programs at the same time. In fact, it's the only public university in Ghana mandated to do so. It's not just a name. It's actually that something we live it every day. And so UPS, we train the head, and that is your critical thinking skills. We train the heart, that's for your attitude, which is key. We train the hands, the ability to 
perform. So if you say you have BS in accounting or finance or marketing or IT or communications, it's not just a knowledge, it's the ability to perform. For example, if you are a marketing student, can you do a marketing plan? Can you do a communication plan? Can you do presentation skills? These are the very things that we do at UPSA. So if you get a UPSA graduate, you are sure that we have set that person on the journey to make you a successful person. That's the UPSA way of doing things. <laughs> hey! Charlie, if you are born and you never become marketing one of the year, you have been cheated. This one is a pitch that when you hear, you start looking for the website of UPSA straight away. And, and, and I can tell you this has been a beautiful conversation. Yeah, let's, let's do this yes, yes, yes. once yes, again yeah. here on your virtual yeah. university. Yeah. A big thank you to all of you listening and watching. And I trust that you've enjoyed this, this beautiful conversation. And here is where you come in. If you are a student, alumnus, faculty, friend, staff, anything of UPSC, or you are planning, or your child is planning to go there, please go to Albert N. E. Okram or Springboard Zone and vote for UPSC. How do you vote? By liking, by sharing, by commenting. All the 10 things Prof has shared. Which one do you see? This one, I agree through and through. Write your comments. And the university that has the biggest comments has won. So it's a simple thing. Make your presence felt on social media. Please call your friend to call a friend to call a friend to share, like, and comment on the thoughts that Prof has shared. I find them very compelling. And I can tell you without any shadow of doubt which one is my favorite. But if I tell you, you vote for that one. So you choose which one you like. And let's keep this conversation going. Facebook, the handle, Albert N. Okran or Springboard Zone. So we come away again next week. My name is Albert Okran on behalf of Team Springboard led by Comfort. And very importantly, our sponsors, the Enterprise Group, MTN Pulse, UMB Bank with our media partners, the Multimedia Group and the Graphic Business. And by the way, on Tuesday in Graphic Business, this whole full story transcribed by the team at Graphic. So till we come your way again next week, my name is Albert Okran saying God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Do, do, do.